I'm amazed that so many people in Sydney had nothing better to do uh, on a not lovely night than come out and listen to me. Um, my topic, as, as Greg mentioned, is what are we fighting for? Uh, Islamism <clears throat> and the threat to liberal values. What I want to do is approach it through three questions that are actually very easy to ask but extraordinarily complex to answer. The first one is what actually is the ideology that drives groups like Al-Qaeda and uh, the Islamic State, Daesh, the, the so-called um, ISIS, as we talk about. Um, where did ISIS come from? And what should we be doing about it? And those, as I said, questions are quite easy to ask, but extraordinarily uh, complex. So first, let me define my terms. Um, by Islamic State, what I mean is the organization whose Arabic name is Adala al Islamia fil Iraq wal Sham, which means the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or Daesh in, in Arabic. Um, it's led by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, um, maybe. He may have been killed on the weekend, no one really knows right now. Um, he, uh, he calls himself Caliph Ibrahim, and the organization is sometimes referred to as the Caliphate. That group fields more than 30,000 fighters. So to put that in context, it's about three times the size of the Taliban. It controls a network of about a dozen cities, uh, significant population and territory across about a third each of Iraq and Syria. It owns economic assets that make it the richest terrorist group in the planet, and it's expanding into the wider region, reinvigorating Islamist terrorism worldwide and radicalizing fringe members of Western societies, including uh, Australians. And there are thousands of foreign fighters now fighting alongside ISIS uh, in the Middle East. When I use the word Islam, just again to be clear, I'm talking about the second largest religion in the world, 1.6 billion Muslims on the planet, founded by the Prophet Muhammad. Um, Muslim is somebody who follows Islam. Um, Islamic is characteristics of the religion. Islamist is a completely different thing. Islamism is a political philosophy which seeks to essentially propagate a particular form of the religion uh, to shape society around it and often to impose it on other people uh, by force. So Islamism and Islamist is completely different in, in many key ways from Islamic, which is uh, a little tricky from a vocab standpoint, but I want to make that, that clear. Other somewhat odd term that I'm going to use is Salafi jihadist. Um, a Salafi is somebody who follows the practices of the early Muslims, the first three generations uh, of Islam, often known as a Salaf Asli, the, the righteous uh, ancestors, so Salafi for short. The Salafi movement arose in the 19th century as a reaction to colonialism. And it was basically people pushing back on the presence of Western powers uh, in the colonial world by reasserting a very literal interpretation of, of Islam. And Salafism experienced a, a resurgence or a revival, what some people call neo-Salafism, in the 1960s, after the failure of nationalism and uh, socialism uh, in the Arab Middle East. There are literally millions of Salafis on the planet. Most of them are not violent. Uh, but a small minority do use violence to spread their beliefs within the framework of a global religious war, a jihad. And we call that very small subgroup um, Salafi jihadists. When I talk about liberal values, and again, this is my sort of last term that I want to define, um, because I live in the States, so I'm going to make the point that I'm not talking about what Americans call progressive politics or, or, or liberal politics. I'm talking about something that's a lot more basic. The, tenets of 19th and 20th century classical liberalism that shape the societies that we live in and in fact are so kind of obvious to us that it's almost like the air we breathe and we don't really um, notice them. Things like individual freedom and accountability, civil liberties, limited government, the rule of law, um, free market economics tempered by uh, a certain amount of regulation, equality of opportunity, religious toleration, taking violence out of politics. Now, we differ enormously about how to apply those ideas and how to define them in some cases. You know, how limited should government be? How much regulation is appropriate? What safety net, if any, uh, should the state provide to its citizens? How should we balance economic opportunity um, with social justice? I want to put it to you that those are actually surface differences. And in fact, there's an enormous amount of consensus around that basic set of classical liberal values certainly in Australian society and American society and to some extent in Europe. Um, as I'll point out later, that, that set of unexamined assumptions about what society is, 
about how it should be organised and what constitutes appropriate conduct within society, assumptions that are shared across virtually the entire political spectrum in our own society are utterly foreign to Islamism, uh, even the non-violent uh, variety. Um, and it's precisely those values that Salafi jihadists are trying to destroy by killing or terrorizing pretty much everybody who holds them. Conversely, it's those values that we ourselves can destroy through our response to terrorism. And we have to walk a very difficult line between those two equal and I would argue opposite um, challenges. So with that as scene setter, let's talk quickly about the ideology that drives Al Qaeda and then uh, ISIS. If you listen to politicians talk, you could be forgiven for thinking that ISIS or Daesh is just a, uh, a successor or an ally of Al Qaeda. For diplomatic and legal reasons, mainly to do with the US authorization for the use of military force and the UN Security Council resolutions that were passed after 9-11, uh, there are reasons that politicians choose to paint uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS as the same. But in fact, the two are quite different. So let's start with, uh, with Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda's ideology has three components, a religious, a political, and a military component. The religious component is really um, the idea of defensive jihad. And this idea is that when infidels, non-Muslims, attack an Islamic state, a defensive war becomes legitimate. And in defensive jihad, as distinct from offensive jihad, which can only be led by a caliph and fought by professional armies in accordance with sort of traditional Islamic norms of warfare, in a defensive jihad, every Muslim has an individual obligation uh, to participate, and the rule set uh, is very different. Now, Al Qaeda tacks onto that religious concept the second component, which is a modern day political interpretation uh, of current events, namely that the encroachment of Western culture, Western values, and foreign policy into the Muslim world, by which Islamists mean all Muslim majority countries, all countries that have a substantial Muslim minority, all countries with Islamic governments, and all territories that have ever at any time been owned by the historical caliphate. So it's a pretty sub substantial um, part of the world. Um, that the encroachment of Western values into that territory is so hostile to Islam that it constitutes an attack on the Islamic world. Um, so the initial concept is that if there is an attack on uh, an Islamic state, then everyone can engage in a defensive jihad. Um, not many people disagree with that. That's basic um, uh, tenet of, of Islam. But the, where Al Qaeda takes that to the next level is to say, and this is a defensive jihad because of stuff like pornography and soccer and democracy and all that stuff that um, comes from the West and is seen as uh, infecting uh, the Islamic world. Al Qaeda in particular regards democracy, which organizes society around human will, not divine will, um, because individuals in democratic societies elect their own governments and governments respond to public opinion. Um, Islamism holds every citizen, every individual in a democratic society responsible for the actions of that society's leaders and for its allies. And so, in other words, Salafi jihadists hold everybody here tonight in this room responsible for Australian policy, US policy, to some extent what Israel does uh, in the Middle East, and see us all as individually responsible for that because we vote in elections and we're responsible for the policies that our political leaders develop. Uh, and so for them, there are no innocents in a democracy. There are no non-combatants because everybody's engaged in developing the policies that they don't like. And as a result, they see as legitimate the targeting of a lot of people who we would regard as non-combatants or innocents. To state the obvious, um, that whole set of ideas stretches to breaking point the idea of defensive jihad uh, in Islam. It broadens behind any, beyond any recognition uh, the meaning of an invasion and it holds every democratic citizen as well as all Muslims that uh, hold to democratic ideas uh, responsible for that supposed invasion. And it puts forward the idea of the Ummah, the, the world's Muslim population, as a virtual state that's being attacked uh, by the West and in defense of which um, jihad becomes legitimate. So it's, it's really an idea that's completely foreign um, to Islam. I sometimes hear people ask, well, if, if it is so foreign to Islam, why don't we hear more Muslims um, condemning or rejecting that idea? Well, actually, they have. Um, 
a number of Islamic scholars and uh, Muslim world leaders over a significant number of years have soundly rejected this particular uh, way of thinking. And in fact, in 2005, 200 Islamic scholars from more than 50 countries got together and issued a thing called the Aman message, which roundly rejected this particular uh, theory of, um, uh, of Islamism. And that message was, was reaffirmed again in 2012. So we've talked religious and we've talked political. Let's just talk quickly about the military component of Al-Qaeda ideology. So you remember the first element was defensive jihad is legitimate. The second element is this is a defensive jihad. The final component argues that because the West is so strong militarily and because it provides support to Israel and to what these groups consider to be apostate regimes in the Middle East, and because Western militaries are so powerful, conventional warfare against the West is a non-starter, right? It's just not feasible. And so their theory is that formed armies fighting force on force in a conventional way in accordance with normal rules of armed conflict will never succeed against the West because we're just so powerful. But at the same time, the Al-Qaeda military theory sees Westerners as weak, as easily exhausted, easily intimidated, and unwilling to die for their beliefs. And so on that basis, they choose terrorism, um, the killing of civilians, uh, kidnapping and torture of innocents, um, intimidation through violence as a military method of choice, as a way of dealing with what they perceive to be our principal um, strategic weakness. So it's not that they're psychopathic, it is a strategic choice to go with that approach. Now that concept of a global guerrilla jihad led Al-Qaeda to a strategy of provocation. 9-11, um, the, the attacks in, in 2001, were designed to provoke a global uprising, a global religious war, by dragging the West into a series of interventions uh, across the Muslim world that would exhaust our political will and our military and financial resources, uh, and ultimately would force us to withdraw in disarray from supporting Israel and the other states that we support uh, in the Middle East, and that would clear the field for a Salafi jihadist takeover. Bin Laden outlined the strategy in 2004, I'm gonna quote, he said, all we have to do is send two Mujahideen to the furthest point east to raise a cloth on which is written the words Al-Qaeda in order to make the generals race there to cause America to suffer human, economic, and political losses without achieving anything of note. So we're continuing this policy of bleeding America to the point of bankruptcy. So he said that in 2004. And he went on to say, Allah willing, and nothing is too great uh, for Allah. So the idea that bin Laden's putting forward here is that our intervention as a result of 9-11 would bog us down in a series of wars of occupation, which in turn would create a backlash that would allow Al-Qaeda to rally local groups within the single unifying narrative of the global jihad and then sort of aggregate their efforts into this worldwide um, Islamic uprising that would transform the planet. Now, a couple of things here. First, notice that the caliphate in Al-Qaeda theory is a very distant future goal, okay? It's not an immediate objective. Um, it's deferred until after the final military victory. And at different times, different Salafi jihadist leaders have spoken about the caliphate as being based in Egypt or in Mecca or in Baghdad. And its very vagueness allows it to serve that unifying function as kind of a millenarian uh, jihadist utopia that's out there far enough that whatever else you might disagree with, you can, you can agree on the ultimate objective. Also notice a certain amount of what you might call magical thinking in the way that Al-Qaeda approaches uh, strategy. The idea that however powerful the enemy might be, whatever the correlation of forces might be, truly Islamic fighters will succeed because they'll demonstrate to Allah their fidelity and commitment and he will provide the victory. So the harsh reality is that while social movement theory and mass psychology and revolutionary warfare theory all have something useful to say about groups like Al-Qaeda, we actually can't ignore the fact that Islam, um, a distorted version of Islam, um, one that most Muslims would scarcely recognize, um, a perversion perhaps, but Islam nonetheless is fundamental to both the ideology and the strategy of a group like Al-Qaeda. There are plenty of murderous ideologies in the world they're not all the same. They reflect the ground from which they spring, and this one springs from Islam. 
Um, so to deny that actually just makes it harder to think about how, in, in a clear way, about how to deal with the problem. On the other hand, though, holding some thing called Islam responsible for terrorism is as much of an overreach as you know, blaming Japanese culture for all the atrocities of World War II or holding all communists responsible for Pol Pot. Um, what we're looking at here is, is, is not only uh, if you do that, you're accepting the Al-Qaeda line that there's only one true Islam and that's what they represent. And you're also treating the vast majority of um, non-violent Muslims as exactly the same as people that are practicing violence in direct contravention of the Prophet Muhammad's words in uh, uh, Baqarah 256, where he said there should be no compulsion uh, in religion. So of course, the other factor is it's a logical fallacy, right, to try to explain a variable effect with a constant cause. So if the sole cause of terrorism is Islam, then we should have seen exactly the same level of terrorism for the last thousand years when the tenets of Islam have been constant, but of course we haven't. So other factors uh, must be at play. So there's a paradox here, right? And I think it's important for us to understand that. On the one hand, only a tiny, tiny percentage of the world's Muslims are involved in this worldwide terrorist jihad. On the other hand, that jihad is a real threat and it only takes a very small number of people to sustain it more or less indefinitely. And of course, everyone who's in that organization is a Muslim. So that creates a fundamental tension. The vast majority of Muslims are not terrorists, but all Salafi jihadists are Muslims. And that can separate Muslims from society. It can create opportunities for authoritarian repression on our part in the name of counterterrorism. It, makes, it has the potential to make every Muslim a target. And it also creates <clears throat> what economists would call a moral hazard. Leaders of Muslim minorities in Western countries can tend to demand special consideration using the implied threat of violence by other people to get what they want and to get special concessions um, from the parent society. And that in turn can separate Muslim minorities from the rest of society. And that's what's so insidious about this particular ideology. Um, it's not only terrorism, but also our reaction to it that can be uh, incredibly destructive. And I would argue, in fact, our reaction has the potential to be vastly more destructive of our societies than anything that uh, terrorist organizations can do. Now, obvious point, but the global uprising that bin Laden was looking for out of 9-11 didn't take place. Um, after 9-11, the international community came down on Al-Qaeda like the proverbial ton of bricks. They were expelled uh, from Afghanistan, significantly damaged in Pakistan, roundly defeated in Saudi Arabia, um, and allied groups in places like Somalia and Yemen uh, and North Africa were temporarily set back. Their affiliates in Southeast Asia, in particular Jamaa Islamiyah, lost a huge amount of support over the last decade. And Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the group that, as Greg mentioned, I fought against in 06, 07, 08, um, were reduced by the end of 2010 to 5% of their fighting strength. So we significantly uh, damaged those guys. US-led coalitions stabilized Iraq and Afghanistan, only to see Iraq unravel within a few years of its leaving. And uh, Afghanistan right now looking rather shaky. So if Al-Qaeda strategy didn't succeed, or at least not in the way that bin Laden was trying to, to do it, does that mean that our strategy, the so-called war on terrorism, or what the Obama administration calls overseas contingency operations, um, has actually worked? Well, unless you've been living under a rock, you would have to know that the answer to that is a resounding no, um, because even as Al-Qaeda has lost ground, ISIS, the, this other group, Daesh, has surged. So let's, not, let's talk about um, ISIS. They come from the same basic Salafi jihadist worldview as Al-Qaeda, so I won't go over that again. They share most of Al-Qaeda's ideology, including the notion of defensive jihad and the focus on terrorism. It's in the second component, the political interpretation, uh, that ISIS parts ways with Al-Qaeda. And that's a very important difference because it results in a completely different strategy and a different set of threats to our societies. ISIS is the successor to Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And that might lead you to suppose that it, its origin comes from that broader Al-Qaeda movement. But actually, it's independent. It comes out of uh, the Jordanian uh, extremist movement in the late 1990s. It's very heavily focused on uh, Shia, anti-Shia sectarianism. Uh, and it peaked in violence in the ferocious violence of the war in Iraq um, between about 04 
uh, and 2010. Now, the first leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, Abu Musab al-Zakawi from Zaka in uh, Jordan, he came up to prominence after the, after the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and he formed terrorist cells to oppose the occupation and allied himself with Sunni nationalist and former regime fighters. He took the al-Qaeda brand basically as a branding exercise so people would know uh, who they were dealing with, and he carried out a whole series of incredibly horrific attacks. Uh, the killing of Sergio Vieira de Mayo, the, um, the UN Special Representative in 2003, beheading of aid workers, kidnapping, rape and murder of Shia children, um, and the 2006 Samara bombing, which started the sectarian conflict uh, in Iraq. Before he was killed in June of 2006, Zakawi had succeeded in unifying several factions into a thing that he called the Islamic State of Iraq, ISI. Um, and that group was responsible for some of the most horrendous atrocities of the war in Iraq. When he was killed in June of 06, he was succeeded by Omar al-Baghdadi, who was himself killed in April of 2010. So the guy that's running the organization now, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who may actually have been seriously injured uh, or killed this last weekend in a US airstrike, um, he expanded the organization into Syria, hence the name Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. They just tacked on the, the extra country when they went in after the beginning of the, uh, the Syrian civil war. It was very clear right from the outset that there were solid ideological and strategic differences between al-Qaeda uh, and Zakawi's group. And they emerged mainly through a correspondence, a series of letters between Zakawi and Ayman al-Zawahiri, who was then the number two of al-Qaeda, which fell into the hands of Western intelligence in 2005. Um, Zakawi viewed Shia Muslims, and by extension, their regional protector, um, Iran, as the greater threat. And he saw Shia as apostates who should just be slaughtered without mercy. He sought to provoke a sectarian civil war that would split Iraq in two, that would generate massive violence and make it impossible for the coalition to stabilize the country, would drive out the occupation forces as he saw them, collapse the state, and then allow his group to essentially inherit the wreckage. That translated into, as I said, horrendous violence. But for all of that horror of the, of the violence, it was not in any way psychopathic or random. It was very carefully tailored to turn Shia against Sunni and turn both groups against uh, the occupiers. Zakawi and al-Qaeda differed not in terms of rejecting violence against the Shia, but as a matter of timing. So Zawahiri, the number two of al-Qaeda, wanted Zakawi to first rally all Iraqis together, push out the occupier, and then deal with the Shia later. Um, and in essence, he said, just form a popular front, kick out the Americans and the Aussies and everybody else, and you can deal with the Shia once they're gone. That's the classic al-Qaeda aggregation strategy that I was talking about, trying to build a united front. Zakawi and his successes have totally rejected that. Not because they're less opposed to the West, far from it, but because of a difference of strategic sequencing. What they want to do is provoke an immediate sectarian conflict with the Shia. They want to use that to unify Sunnis across the region. They want to then form a caliphate, not as some long distant um, objective, but right now on the ground, and then expand that caliphate through territorial conquest that looks a lot more like conventional warfare than the kind of terrorism that we've seen uh, from al-Qaeda. So what for al-Qaeda is a distant utopia, for ISIS is an immediate real world 2014 uh, practical goal. So that means a real state with a real territory, an army, a government, uh, an economy, a population that it controls, and that makes ISIS a much more conventional nation building exercise. Um, unlike al-Qaeda, with this very postmodern uh, idea of a virtual, non-territorial Islamic state of guerrilla cells that kind of act locally and think globally, um, and it's called for an uprising by all Muslims everywhere against the West, what ISIS wants is a caliphate now in Iraq and Syria, which will then expand through military conquest. So that's why Webb, whereas bin Laden said, if you support al-Qaeda, attack Westerners wherever you may be, Baghdadi says, if you support ISIS, come to Syria. And he put out a call for doctors, lawyers, teachers, obviously engineers, military people to come and join the state and build a state in Syria. So far from wanting to provoke Western intervention, which was very much the Al-Qaeda strategy, ISIS is looking for breathing space. It wants to grow and to become strong enough that it can then expand 
uh, territorial. It's, it, it's ultimately no less hostile to the West, but it's all about this territorial expansion. If Al-Qaeda's agenda is very 21st century, ISIS looks to a lot of my friends in Syria and Iraq a lot like the 7th century. So after Muhammad's death in 632 AD, there was a series of wars which people now call the Wars of Muslim Conquest, which was basically the formation of a caliph, uh, the successor to Muhammad, creation of a caliphate, and then territorial expansion by military conflict. And that brought uh, Islamic leaders within a few decades to control the whole Middle East, North Africa, South and Central Asia, eventually Southern Spain and Southern Italy. And those wars um, created really the largest pre-modern empire in history. And the restoration of the caliphate that ISIS is talking about is in that mode. It is not some kind of virtual thing that Al-Qaeda has been talking about. It's a physical state on the ground. That whole set of ideas has had a massively reinvigorating effect on the global jihad. We've seen groups um, renewing and becoming um, stronger in the way that they operate in Indonesia, the Philippines, North Africa, and across the Middle East. A lot of fighters, as we talked about, have traveled to join ISIS from those areas, as well as from Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, Latin America. Um, and indeed, foreign fighter flows into Syria now are about 10 to 12 times the size of anything that we saw during the height of the Iraq war. So it's huge. So next key question is, where did these guys come from? And um, you know, sort of what do, what do they matter? Um, I guess the question is, how did ISIS come to join al-Qaeda at that peak of the global jihad from virtually a standing start only three years ago? Two key events um, are worth noting here. The death of bin Laden in May of 2011 and the failure of the Arab Spring. So bin Laden's death on the 2nd of May uh, three years ago threw al-Qaeda into disarray. They went through a succession struggle. It took several months for Ayman al-Zawahri to emerge as the undisputed leader. And those months were critical because mid-2011 was when the Arab Spring seemed to be succeeding. Um, secular, democratic, largely peaceful protest movements in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, uh, and Yemen had successfully thrown off dictatorships in all those countries. And for a time, that seemed to contradict al-Qaeda's ideology, which said that the only way to overthrow these regimes was through terrorism against the West. But now you had peaceful protesters achieving what al-Qaeda had failed to achieve in 20 years of violence. By 2011, though, it was clear, by late 2011, sort of December of 2011, it was clear that the Arab Spring was going to fail. It was not going to deliver stable democracy to the Middle East. Egypt slipped back into authoritarianism. Yemen remained hugely violent. Um, Libyans successfully threw off Gaddafi, but they inherited a, a power vacuum that became increasingly uh, violent over time. A crackdown in Bahrain totally crushed the democracy protests there. Most importantly, in Syria, the early promise of a peaceful transition away from the Iranian-backed Damascus regime of Bashar al-Assad had totally failed, and protests escalated into a horrific sectarian civil war. So peaceful methods had failed by the end of 2011, except maybe in Tunisia, which for the moment looks like the exception uh, that proves the rule. And insurgencies emerged in Syria, Libya, in Egypt, in the Sinai Desert, uh, and in Mali, actually, which is a direct result of the fall of Gaddafi. Al-Qaeda, as I mentioned, was in disarray. And so the Arab Spring seems to have caught them flat-footed. They didn't really know uh, how to react, and they didn't react in a, in a quick way. So as people became disillusioned with the democracy protests and turned back to the idea of violence at the end of 2011, they didn't look to Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda had been discredited. Instead, they looked to this new group, um, ISIS. ISIS, for its part, used Syria to reinvent itself after its defeat in Iraq. So you recall, as I said earlier, the organization was down to only 5% of its fighting strength by the end of 2011. It was scattered, was on the run from Iraqi uh, and US forces. As the Syrian regime unfolded, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi sent a very small cadre of guys to Syria to try to save the movement. And in Syria, they found sanctuary from the pressure that they were experiencing in Iraq. They were able to regroup and re-equip. And because of their battle experience, this is the hardcore of guys that had survived my best efforts and the best efforts of a lot of people like me to kill them over a number of years. Um, those guys were battle-hardened and experienced. 
and they were able to really reinvigorate the organisation quickly and they gained a lot of financial support from Salafi donors across the region. They were very tightly organised and most importantly they had a very concrete, specific political agenda. And so people rallied to them as just a, a competent bunch of guys that were really taking the fight um, forward. Um, three factors helped them. The Assad, re Assad regime, ironically, um, the West's failure to support the democracy movement in Syria, and the Iraqi government in Baghdad. So in Syria, Assad had always claimed that his opposition was entirely composed of jihadist terrorists. And at first, that was a total lie. Um, the same broad-based, secular, pro-democracy movement that we saw in the rest of the Arab Spring was what we saw also in Syria. But the violence of Assad's crackdown quickly turned that protest into an insurgency. Civilian leaders got sidelined, armed groups began to grow, secular pro-democracy groups were pushed aside and extremist groups uh, began to, to take their place. And Assad, uh, his lie of 2011 became the truth by 2013. Um, in order to further his agenda of saying that the enemy were jihadist, Assad basically ran a de facto truce with ISIS. There have never been any significant Syrian regime offensives against ISIS. And in fact, for a long time, there weren't any significant ISIS efforts against the regime either. They had essentially a live and let live deal because the existence of ISIS helped the propaganda line that uh, Assad was trying to put forward. And so he essentially connived at them ending up controlling about a third of um, mainly desert parts of, of Syria. Um, and I ISIS in its turn avoided confronting the regime directly and focused instead on taking out all of its potential rivals across the rebel um, side of the, uh, of the movement. So today, Raqqa is the ISIS capital, um, its major base. It's home to hundreds out of the thousands of foreign fighters that have flocked to join ISIS. Second fa factor, very important, was our failure to support the secular democracy movement in uh, Syria. Um, I know Syria well, and I can tell you that it is a self-serving myth to say that there was never any chance that the democracy movement or that the secular movement would succeed. The d democratic opposition to Assad in 2011 was stronger, better organised, with more popular support than what we saw in Egypt or in Libya. Um, it had uh, a much better basis uh, to succeed. Firm diplomatic pressure by the West in 2011, military support to the democratic groups in 2012, uh, and deterrent strikes against Assad in 2013, when he began to use chemical weapons against his own population, could have made a real and significant difference to the environment that we saw, uh, that we see today in Syria. But instead, of course, as you know, we were tied up in Libya in 2011. We gave virtually no support to the secular democracy movement, and we offered help really too little too late to the secular rebels. I'm not suggesting we should have invaded Syria, um, but I am suggesting that Western diplomatic pressure to ensure a political transition backed by force, because diplomacy without force is just talking, um, would have had the potential to make a really significant difference on the ground. Um, and even now, um, because Western countries have not committed clearly to a regime change in Syria, it's extraordinarily difficult to get ordinary Syrians to back the effort. They see us attacking the strongest opposition group that's taking the fight to Assad and not attacking the regime. And they say the, see the regime filling the vacuum that's left when we strike ISIS. And for guys whose whole thing is about trying to overthrow Assad, that doesn't look a lot like success. So many of them are just not keen to support the effort. Final factor was the Iraqi government. Um, and it's kind of lurched into sectarianism at the end of 2011. Um, I hear a lot of people blaming Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki here. Um, people say, you know, what happened to Maliki? How did he go from being inclusive in 2007, 2008 to being sectarian uh, in 2012? And even asking that question bespeaks a total lack of understanding of conditions on the ground in Iraq. Yes, Maliki was relatively inclusive in 2007 and 2008. That's when we had 165,000 US troops in Baghdad and in the districts around Baghdad. And when we had advisors embedded across his entire government structure, and we were spending billions of dollars in assistance um, that gave us enormous leverage. And we could ensure a fair outcome. We actually acted more like a playground umpire, ensuring fairness, which meant that he could afford to be inclusive. He could afford to strike deals with people because he knew that someone was going to enforce the outcome. Um, when we left, 
and left behind zero um, military, hardly any civilian advisors, and cut a lot of the assistance, we lost that leverage. And we left Maliki in a situation where it was now zero sum. And anything that he gave up would be gained by his enemies, and he was just not in a position to be more inclusive. He had to act uh, to consolidate his Shia popula popular support, and he had to, had to uh, solidify support from the Iranians. He immediately reneged on a series of deals that were made with the Sunni community uh, and with the Kurds. Very importantly to the outcome of this year's fighting, he sidelined a lot of the professional US-trained military and police leaders and replaced them with sectarian loyalists who were also often quite corrupt and not particularly good um, at fighting. As a result, by 2013, Iraq was in disarray. The Kurds and the Sunnis felt betrayed by Baghdad. Tribal elders had been hung out to dry. Uh, the Iraqi security forces were engaged in what a lot of Iraqi Sunnis saw as essentially sectarian ethnic cleansing. And there was space there for a return of ISIS. So ISIS was defeated in Iraq, it reinvigorated itself in Syria, and then it came roaring back into Iraq, into the space created um, by our withdrawal. So if that's a threat, what should we do about it? And I think we need to consider, as I said earlier, both the threat from Islamist terrorism and the threat from our own actions against it um, that can damage our societies. We can break the terrorist threat down into four components. Domestic radicalization, foreign fighters, the um, effect on regional terrorist groups, the sort of reinvigorating effect that I talked about, and destabilization in the broader Middle East. To be viable, our strategic approach needs to address all four of those threats, and I would argue in that priority order. So domestic radicalization, I think, is the most important threat. What we see in Western societies is the seductive pull of Daesh, uh, ISIS, on marginalized individuals who feel themselves to be disenfranchised, to be losers in our society. Um, they don't see opportunity to advance themselves, and they want to be part of something that is big and historic and seems to be very successful. And ISIS offers them that. They can be significant, they can be successful, they can be part of something that's historic. And I, I defer to people that know the Australian situation better than I do, but a lot of the European and UK and other foreign fighters who go to join ISIS in Syria are not particularly ideological. They are mainly young men and significantly a large number of young women in search of adventure and of something big that's outside themselves like you know, leftists going to fight in Spain during the Spanish Civil War, or indeed not unlike Aussies going to fight for the empire in 1914. So I don't want to create any kind of moral equivalence here, but I want to just point out that these guys are not necessarily dyed in the wool Salafi jihadists. They're people who want to seek adventure, significance, and opportunity that they're not getting out of their society. Western governments since 9-11 have had a bad habit Oh, and I, I'm criticising myself here because, as Greg said, I was part of the, the policy settings uh, early in the piece of orientalising Muslims, right? So treating them as kind of a special case, an exotic, potentially violent minority that have to be dealt with with kid gloves. Um, and often our governments have sought to deal with Muslims by creating these kind of intermediary contact groups of traditional elders, um, appointed, sometimes self-appointed, conservative uh, leaders who the government treats as intermediaries and hopes that they'll sort of keep their young men and women uh, in line uh, and that we can deal with cooler heads uh, and they'll prevail. I think that has three really bad effects. Firstly, these so-called elders are often by definition more conservative, more authoritarian and traditionalist, and by deferring to them, we're actually deepening the marginalization of young Muslims who tend to be a lot uh, more integrated into our societies anyway. Secondly, as I said earlier, there's a moral hazard. People are encouraged to look for special treatment, um, to set themselves apart from the rest of society and leveraging sort of the existence of extremist crazies uh, off stage, they can demand special concessions to advance their agenda. And that tends to move entire communities in a more sectarian, more segregated direction. And it creates divisions within our society that extremists can then exploit. Um, Finally, I think it creates the impression that a whole community is responsible for the actions of a criminal lunatic fringe on the other side of the world. And I think we need to completely do away with that approach. And again, I'm critiquing my own uh, work 10 years ago. Repression, surveillance, special intermediaries, 
just make the problem worse. We need to treat Australian Muslims the same way we treat Australian Catholics or Australian Hindus or any other Australian, with all the individual rights and responsibilities that come from free membership in a free society. If people engage in criminal acts, they need to be treated like any other criminal. We need to open up opportunities for self-expression and free agency within our own societies so people can see that the answer to their problems, the opportunities, lie here, not in some uh, radical death cult on the other side of the planet. So the answer to domestic radicalization is actually not more oppression and control, it's less, it's more freedom. That opens up the opportunity for young people to say, you know what, I don't need to join ISIS, I can get everything I want to do here uh, in my own society. Likewise though, with freedom comes responsibility. We need to be clear that we don't plan to turn our societies inside out just to make a disloyal minority feel better about themselves. Um, the liberal values that lie at the heart of our society on which virtually everyone agrees are not up for discussion, um, and they can't be. We can't afford to be tolerant of intolerance or to allow the implied threat of violence by somebody else um, to let a minority, any minority, uh, religious or otherwise, hold the rest of us to ransom. That's the first threat, and I've spent a lot of time in that because I think it's the most important one. Second one is the threat of foreign fighters. That's where the money is, by the way, which is why intelligence services and police spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and here the risk is that members of our own society will join ISIS or Al-Qaeda, they'll re-infiltrate back, and they'll carry out some kind of an attack uh, in our own territory. That threat is definitely real. Um, but we need to calibrate our response extraordinarily carefully, lest we do more harm than good. As an example, I often hear people say, well, why do we need to intervene overseas? Why send diggers to the Middle East? Why don't we just pull up the drawbridge, take defensive action here, protect ourselves, and then everything's going to be fine? I'm afraid that approach really doesn't work. In the first place, there's no drawbridge, right? Australia's an open society. We're very connected with the rest of the world. Our freedom and our prosperity depends entirely on maintaining that openness. Secondly, we need to be crystal clear about what defensive measures actually means. They would include mass surveillance, collection of personal data, suppression of dissent, limits on free discussion, tracking of individuals based on suspicion, detention without trial, travel restrictions, financial restrictions, a pervasive police and security force presence, including maybe fortified checkpoints in public places, heavily armed police, gun carrying intelligence agencies that have the ability to arrest you or shoot you, um, and in fact, in many societies since 9-11, we've moved a significant distance towards this kind of um, uh, situation. The risk here is that we might actually destroy our free and open society in order to save it. A fully protected society looks a hell of a lot like a police state. There's a very stark trade-off here. To put it one way, how many terrorist attacks, bombings or assassinations are we prepared to accept in Australia as the price of preserving our freedom? Conversely, how much privacy, freedom, and civil liberty are we prepared to give up in order to protect ourselves um, from those kinds of threats? You can't have your cake and eat it too. Um, in a democracy, this is a decision that only the people can make. Um, technocrats, particularly security personnel, um, dudes like me, to be honest, um, anyone whose professional advancement or budget or organizational status depends on the answer to the question, shouldn't be allowed to have a vote. It has to be a referendum or a public debate in which people that you know, don't have a personal stake in the outcome, other than they want to live in a free society and also be safe, um, get to have the final say. I also think we have to be extraordinarily careful about retrospectively or retroactively blaming politicians. If we as a society decide that we're prepared to accept a certain level of risk and there is an attack, we can't then go back and hang the politicians that were in charge at the time. Because then you end up with a security ratchet where you raise security levels but you can never drop them because nobody wants to be the guy that dropped security and then there was an attack. Um, so these trade-offs are really critical. And everybody has a role. Um, and you know, all of us in this room tonight should have a significant say uh, in that discussion. The third thread I'll cover real quickly and that's the effect on regional terrorist groups. Not because it's not important but because we actually are doing pretty well um, at that one. Australia has had a very strong role since the, se since the first Bali bombing in 2002 in regional uh, collaboration. So assistance to regional partners, information sharing, 
uh, cooperation on regional preparedness, joint investigations when uh, incidents occur. These are all things that we've put in place uh, since the Bali conference in 2003, after the first Bali bombing in 2002. And those have largely been effective in our region. Um, and we need to think, I think, about widening that regional network and maybe about how to react to increased threats. But in general terms, um, I think we're getting that aspect of the threat about right. But mind you, I would say that because that's the part that I worked on. Um, the final threat, though, um, is, is the destabilising effect of ISIS in the Middle East. And, you know, that's the one in which our troops are engaged uh, right now in Iraq. And to me, the logic of this is extraordinarily clear. We've already talked about how attractive ISIS can be to disaffected elements within our own society. It has an appeal precisely because of what seems to be a string of unbroken military victories. And it looks successful. It looks like it's building and becoming the thing that people want it to be. Um, we can turn our society upside down in order to make every disaffected young Muslim male in Sydney and Melbourne feel okay about themselves, or we can go and kick seven kinds of crap out of the Islamic State in Iraq. For my money, that's the better option. Um, and I think that um, inflicting damage on the Islamic State to take the shine off it, to make it less of an attractive option, shows people that it can do, be defeated, and it emphasises to a lot of young Australians and others that joining ISIS is a bit of a fool's errand. Um, it's pretty dangerous over there. You might not make it back. Um, and if we want to limit the restrictions to our freedom in this country, we really have to deal with the supply side as well as the demand side of this problem. We have to get over there and deal with what it is uh, that's making uh, people flock to join ISIS. So now, let me just be clear, I'm emphatically not talking about reinvading or reoccupying Iraq. That was a disaster the first time around. Doing it again wouldn't make it any better. Um, I'm also not talking about a campaign to destroy the Assad regime in Syria uh, militarily. What I'm talking about is a targeted effort in both Iraq and Syria that uses a combination of air power, special operations, military assistance, and a limited number of combat troops to destroy the ability of ISIS to carry out its strategy, which, remember, is not terrorism like al-Qaeda. It's territorial control and expansion. It's much more conventional. This is not a counterinsurgency. It's a straight-up tank-on-tank you know, fight. Um, and I think that the other element of this is to put enough pressure on Bashar al-Assad to ensure a negotiated settlement to the Syrian civil war, one in which secular democracy with international support plays a key role, although it's not going to play uh, the only role. I want to conclude with two um, observations. And the first is to re-emphasize something that I um, and others, like Kate McGregor, who was, in fact, the one who brought me to CIS more than a, year, uh, a dozen years ago, um, have been saying for all that time, which is that this is going to be um, a long war. It's a multi-generational struggle between two fundamentally opposed sets of values. It's already been going on for about half a century since the, seven day, uh, the Six Day War in, in 1967. It's probably got just as long to run in front of us uh, as we've seen already. One mistake we made after 9-11 was focusing too narrowly on Al-Qaeda, as if killing senior Al-Qaeda leaders equated to defeating Al-Qaeda, or as if defeating Al-Qaeda equated to dealing with the terrorist threat. Um, let's not make the same mistake again with ISIS. We will defeat ISIS, I have no doubt about that. But if that's all we do, if we don't think more broadly about all these issues that I've been talking about tonight, we'll find ourselves back here again in another 10 years talking about the successor organisation to ISIS, and in 20 years, the successor to that. We'll keep on seeing new organisations um, re-emerge. We've got to um, think about uh, ways to deal with a threat that are cheap enough, non-intrusive enough, that are protective of our own values, uh, and are sustainable enough that we can keep on doing them essentially indefinitely without destroying the free society that we're trying to protect. And I would argue that invading, occupying, and trying to reconstruct other people's countries is not the answer, but sitting at home and turning Australia into a police state is also not the answer. The truth is somewhere in between. Um, final point is I've spent a lot of time tonight talking about what we're fighting against, right? The enemy, enemy's ideology and strategy. But I want to remember for a second what we're fighting for, those values on which our society is founded and whatever else we might disagree on, which we have um, very significant consensus about. We believe in individual freedom and the, pers the personal responsibility that comes with that. We believe in the pursuit of happiness, the sanctity of human life in a secular state 
uh, whose authority derives from the consent of the governed and whose purpose is to serve the needs of its citizens. We believe in a free market economy tempered by appropriate regulation and in the rule of law as established by human society, uh, not some other thing. We believe in respect for the rights of others um, in gender equality, uh, including women's autonomy, reproductive freedom, freedom of sexual relations between consenting adults. We believe in social justice based on the equality of opportunity and access, and we principally believe in human progress through innovation and creativity. Yes, we disagree a lot on how to balance those values and on what form they should take and their relative priority, but let's recognise how utterly and unalterably alien those beliefs are to Salafi jihadists like Al-Qaeda or ISIS or any of their fellow travellers, including those who don't actively use violence. Intolerance of difference, um, religion as a total explanation for all aspects of life, communal as distinct from individual purpose, the imposition of beliefs on other people by force, the subjugation of women, uh, a cult of death perpetrated by sort of hyper-violent nihilistic exterminators, um, a theocratic state whose authority derives from the divine rather than from the human society, um, a non-rational cult of authority, intolerance of sexual or gender freedom, um, hostility to innovation and progress, return to the supposedly righteous uh, behaviour of the seventh century. That's the ideology of the opponent that we're talking about here. ISIS and groups like it are horrendous, but they're not unique. In some ways, they're actually just the latest in a long line of ideological enemies of classical liberal democracy. Foes of the Enlightenment that go back to the 18th century with absolutist monarchism or clericalism and authoritarianism um, to 19th century ideas like Slavophilism and communism, or of course, 20th century movements like the Nazi racial community of blood and soil, um, fascism, Japanese militarism, or Stalinism. Today's threat, I firmly believe, is going to go the historical way of all those other threats. It's going to bite the dust. I've no doubt about that, but it won't happen without hard work from all of us and without a conscious effort to preserve our freedoms here at home, even while we defend them uh, abroad. Thanks for listening to me rant. Um, I'm going to take a break now, and I think we're going to reconvene for questions uh, in a few minutes. Thanks. Thanks.